Let me ask you a question. Um, how many of you have taken a, a DNA test to discover your ancestry? So, two, okay, five or so, six. <clears throat> My wife and I was interesting. Got mine back because I'm 100% Irish. <laughs> Marita, she's got a lot of surprises. She's got Morocco and Jewish and all these things. So praise the Lord. But um, DNA test. Uh, I had other surprises when I took DNA tests. I found out I had uh, siblings I didn't know about. So that's, that's interesting. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> Father's Day is a, uh, is a mixed bag. You know, Mother's Day kind of smooth sailing. Father's Day uh, can be tough. Uh, I remember taking a note several years ago, I was teaching Sunday school downstairs here that none of my Sunday school boys had, had a father at home and it had been that way for a long time. <clears throat> so Father's Day is a, uh, is kind of a mixed bag for a lot of people. Um, and even this morning, I, I felt uh, a burden to uh, ask two of my kids for forgiveness. And so, um, you know, maybe I saw things differently than them, but I think forgiveness and Father's Day go together. Uh, you know, there's things that, uh, great things I can remember about my dad, but there's also things that um, I didn't respect him for. Let's say that. And respect is one thing, you have to earn respect. You have to earn respect. But we can forgive someone even if we didn't respect something they did. And I, I would encourage you, if you have had a father um, <clears throat> that maybe didn't do everything right, that you, you learn to forgive him. It, it's healing for you. Um, also, I, I really rejoice in, in how um, a number of you have adopted children, you know, boys, girls. Uh, that's a tremendous thing. We read earlier, I shared in the Lord's Supper, uh, pure religion, it says, is to uh, remember the widows and the orphans. And so it's a great opportunity. I, I know I think of Brother Rob here, how uh, the Lord, uh, he didn't have a dad growing up, but he came here and he had he had a number of dads, you know, Lyman Gordon and maybe uh, David Reed after that and others. But so um, I just really uh, appreciate how a lot of you are, being moms and, and fathers to, to kids that, that are in that um, difficult uh, situation in life. So uh, Father's Day is sometimes a tough thing, especially if you've done your DNA and you find out you've got siblings you didn't know. <laughs> like, how'd that happen? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I want to get back to our, our series here. We promised you we, we would do the Mamas and the Papas. So we did the Mamas on uh, James. The title is, is for you. We know you know the Mamas and the Papas. Not everybody else here would know who they were, but James would. But uh, we did uh, Mary as an example uh, of a, a godly uh, woman for Mother's Day. Today we're going to do Joseph. Okay, so again, we're not we're not praying to saints, but we just we just think that uh, we can appreciate something about some of these people. But uh, turn first to uh, Luke chapter 2, please. Luke chapter 2. Uh, verses 1 through 5. So uh, Joseph didn't need a DNA test. Back in his day, especially if you were from the line of Judah, you, you knew who your fathers were. <laughs> and Joseph knew who his fathers were, his ancestors, all the way back. And uh, so we read here in, in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to actually, we're going to go to Matthew after this, because that's mostly what we're going to consider. But just for background, Luke chapter 2. Uh, so you can, you can wish everybody a Merry Christmas after this message, because this sounds like it's a Christmas message, right? Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. So you had to know where your city of your ancestors were back then. 
And Joseph, verse 4, also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So Joseph knew he was of the house and line of David. Now we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 1. And I'm using the Bible from your seats so I can help with the pages. So this would be page uh, 833. Matthew chapter 1, page 833 in this the brown Bibles in your seats, if you're using that. And we'll, we'll be in Matthew for a little while. Um, so this is lessons from the life of Joseph, the earthly dad of Jesus. Uh, some would say, uh, use the term stepfather, but I like the term steward father because uh, he's, he was a steward to, to step into that role and, and be a, be a father for the Lord during his earthly time. And um, I think all of us who are fathers, we're, we're stewards also. These children belong to God. We, we've been loaned them as a responsibility, and uh, we have a stewardship that we're accountable to the Father for. So <clears throat> praise the Lord for uh, a good example of a, a steward father in Joseph. And... Uh, if, you, if you're noting uh, titles, here's one. Uh, Joseph was not your average Joe. He's not your average Joe. Okay. So Matthew uh, 1, we'll uh, read verse uh, 1 and 2, and then we'll jump to verse 16. This is the genealogy of, of the Lord Jesus. It starts out with, uh, when, I, when I was first given a Bible, uh, when I was 20 years old, uh, the man who gave it to me, he says, he says, uh, he told me, start in verse 18. He says, you skip, skip the genealogy because he figured I'd be bored with that. But actually, genealogy is very important. But um, so Matthew chapter one, verse one, it says the book of the genealogy or the ancestry of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. And then we have the line continuing. Then verse 16. And Jacob, there's another Jacob now, we got Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So we have the, the lineage of, of Joseph here. And it says here that he is the husband of Mary, of whom, and the word whom there, interestingly, is feminine. So it's Jesus is born of, of a woman. Uh, but Joseph uh, was her husband. So he had a very important role. And so Joseph knew his genealogy. He, he knew who his fathers were. He had a, a, proud, a proud ancestry. Um, son of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and all the kings of, of Judah. That's, that's a great thing to have a, a proud genealogy, proud ancestry. But more important than knowing who your earthly father is, and some people don't know who their earthly father is. I mentioned my uh, DNA analysis, and the person who turned out to be my brother, he, he wanted to know who his father was. <laughs> that was an interesting, and still is an interesting relationship. But people want to know, who their father is but more important than who your earthly father is is to know for sure that you are a true child of god that's that's more important really you can't take a dna test to discover that but there is a biblical test of whether you are a true child of god jesus said in john chapter 3 you must be born again and he said that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So our earthly father and mother, they give us physical life. But we have to go to our heavenly father to have spiritual life, to be born of the spirit, to be born of God. So something has to happen from the time we're born until we die that makes us a child of God. We're not born a child of God. We're God's creation. And in a, in a real sense, there's, a, there's a, a, a general sense of the fatherhood of God in that he created all and, and does care for his, his creation. 
But for God to be uh, our father in a biblical sense requires that we be born again. We be born again. But, but how can we become born again? We read in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, many, as many as received Jesus Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in him, believe in his name, or trust in him. So let me repeat that. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, believe, believe in him. So we must be born again, born of God, by, by putting our, our trust in, in Jesus Christ, by trusting what he did on the cross specifically for us, that it was on the cross that our sin was placed on him. God judged our sin in, in Christ on the cross. And by, by doing that, we receive him and become a child of God. Uh, often I, if I get a chance to speak, we bring the gospel in at the end. But I decided we should emphasize that in the beginning here today, lest we forget to mention that at all, right? Father's Day, is God your father? Is God your, your true father? I know God was not my true father until I was 20 years of age when I, I sensed my need. I felt like a lost sheep, and I, I wanted Jesus to pick me up, put me on my, his shoulders, and, and carry me home. I, I, I sensed that. I hope that each of you have sensed your need for Christ in a personal way and said yes to him. Said yes to him. You know, um, Joseph, uh, we read in verse 16, he was the, he was the uh, husband of Mary. And uh, Joseph was a good wife picker. You couldn't get a better wife than, than Mary, really. She was a, a solid Bible student. If you read the Magnificat, she's, she really knew the scriptures. She was obedient to God. She was humble. Uh, it's generally speaking, uh, it's a it's a very good measure of a man his wisdom and his commitment to the Lord by, by the wife that he picks. And often in uh, thinking of uh, elders, potential elders in a church, we, we say, who's his wife? What, what is she like? And that, that tells us his, his commitment to the Lord. And, and a wife can be either a, uh, an anchor or a sail. Same thing with a husband, ladies. <laughs> can be an anchor or a sail. In other words, can can slow you down or it can or it can push you on. And Mary was a sail. But I'm thinking of another uh woman too in, in this regard. In in Genesis, um Abraham had a son, Isaac, and he wanted a, a wife for his son. Isaac wanted a wife too. <laughs> so Abraham sent his servant, the unnamed servant, uh, and uh it's not named in that passage. And the servant goes off and finds um, Rebecca and uh, says to Rebecca, um, he, he wants her to come back and be Isaac's wife. And he tells her father and her brother, and they say, well, we'll leave it up to her. And they ask her, uh, Rebecca, will you go? And she says, I will go. And so uh, coming to Christ requires a, a call from God, right? The Holy Spirit has to draw us, and he, and he does. He's gone out, and he's drawn many. Some say no, but we have to say yes to him, okay? That's that's the bottom line. We have to say yes. Like Rebecca says, yes, I will go. And she came, and she she came all that distance, and she became the, the wife of, of Isaac, and they were, they were one. And so God calls us to be his children, and we have to say yes, Lord. And And that was... Um, what Rebecca did. Well, let's read on a little bit more about uh, Joseph here in, in Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 18. Read, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. So Joseph discovers that his wife, 
he's engaged to, they call it betrothal, where you would be promised to each other, and then a, a year later, you actually would come and live together. But in this time, he finds that she's pregnant. And so Joseph is going to put her away, basically divorced, which you could do at that moment in time in, in Israel uh, while you're not yet married to her. So he's going to put her away, but um, so we find he, he's a just man. He's going to do what, what's just, what's right. But we find also he's a merciful man. He's a merciful man. He's not going to do it publicly so that she'd be shamed and, and perhaps seriously. Uh, there, there was a, a law in, in uh, Israel, in the, uh, although apparently it wasn't often followed through, but you could be stoned for, for adultery. So Joseph is, he's a just man. He's going to put her away, but he's, but he's a merciful man. And so this is a characteristic of fathers that, are very important. We'd be just and merciful. We'll, we'll think more about that later when we get to child discipline. <laughs> but that's that's Joseph here. Of course, God speaks to him, tells him, hold on, Joseph. <laughs> Verse 20, Matthew 1, 20. Read uh, 20 to 24. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth the Son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife. So Joseph was thinking about these things. What, what do I do? He's thinking about these things. And I, I picture his thinking as not just thinking, but thinking in prayer. You know, often when we go to prayers, sometimes I, I just don't know what to do about a situation. And I just I just kneel down at home, maybe next to my bed, and just I just kind of think, but I'm but I'm praying and thinking at the same time, thinking, seeking the Lord in it. So Joseph is, is thinking about these things. He's open to God's leading. And God tells him, don't be afraid. T take her. That's a big step for him to do in this culture. Nobody else knows about this, that she's conceived this child by the Holy Spirit. It never happened in the history of the world. It never happened again. But Joseph, uh, he's, he's seeking God's leading, and, and he obeyed God's leading. So I think he's a great example to us in, in, in these ways as well for fathers seeking God's leading and, and obeying God's leading. Okay. So let's, let's be thoughtful about the decisions in life. And then we read in, um, in Matthew uh, 24 and 25, it says, then one twenty four and 25, then Joseph being roused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her. So she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. A, a patient man, too. A patient man. He, he didn't know her. All this time, they're together, even. And for some reason, maybe God told him, in this case, just, just, just wait. <laughs> he, he was a patient man. But we also know, hold your spot there in chapter one, but we also know he was, he was a normal man. <laughs> uh, we read in, in Matthew, we mentioned this last time, in Matthew 13, verses uh, 55 and 56. It says, uh, they're speaking of, the Lord Jesus is, is teaching and people are, are wondering, how, how does he not have such wisdom? Matthew 13, 55, it says, is not this the carpenter's son? So speaking of Joseph, Joseph is the carpenter, right? Is not Jesus the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Josie, Simon, and Judas? So he's got four brothers and his sisters, plural. Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So we learn from that that uh, Joseph had at least Seven children, seven children. 
So he was a patient man, but he was a normal man. And then we read in uh, chapter two, more about Joseph. Chapter two, verse uh, 13 and 14. Now, the Lord is born and the, the wise men come and they are told to go, you know, go away quietly um, because Herod will be looking for this child since they told Herod that a king has been born <laughs> and Herod is the king. So he's not happy about another king being on the scene here. And so we read in, in uh, Matthew 2, verse 13 and 14. It says, now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. But Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. So we see, uh, Joseph uh, protected his family. He protected his family. He followed the Lord's direct leading, and he protected them. So our goal of any dad is to keep his family safe. And Joseph did that, looking, looking to the Lord for guidance. Now, we read in, uh, in Matthew uh, a moment ago, Matthew 13, about Joseph's large family. And um, Joseph uh, labored to support his family. Remember, he, we read in that Matthew 13, 55, he, he's called a carpenter. Instead of Jesus, he's the carpenter's son. So Joseph was a carpenter. He, he labored to support his large family. He, he, had a, he was known as a carpenter. He's not like just an occasional thing. He, he was a guy that had a carpenter shop and, or maybe the contractor, but he's known in town. Everybody knows, oh, that's the carpenter. He was a laborer. He, he did his work to support his family. And he's an example to, to fathers for sure in that regard. A Bible commentator, John Noland, writes that a carpenter was typically a woodworking craftsman who built furniture and utensils, doors and door frames, and prepared roofing beams. A carpenter may also have worked some with stone and metal. Now, uh, you don't know have to turn to it, but uh, Mark 6.3 not only was Joseph a carpenter, but in Mark 6, 3, we read concerning Jesus, it says, is this not the carpenter? Speaking of Jesus, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? So not only was Joseph a carpenter, but his son was a carpenter, the Lord Jesus. And Maybe his other brothers were too. We're not told that, but Joseph taught his sons his own trade. That's that's an interesting thing. He taught his sons his own trade. Think of uh, Brother Ramos there. Did, did your father have any influence in you becoming a mechanic? Did you learn something from his shop? <laughs> Amen. So that's a tremendous thing if a father can do that. I. I wasn't able to do that for my family, but um, I did try to help them go to college. <laughs> but um, he taught his sons his trade. And so Jesus was a carpenter. Uh, there's an early church uh, writer named Justin Martyr, M-A-R-T-Y-R, who lived from 100 until 165. And he wrote, and we don't know that this is, Definitely true, but he wrote that Jesus built plows and yokes. So that would be another thing a carpenter might do is to build large plows and, and yokes for, for oxen, for animals. And so that's, that's heavy, heavy woodwork. But Joseph was a carpenter and his son, the Lord Jesus, was a carpenter. Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And, and Joseph left an inheritance to his, to his son in that he, he gave him a trade. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And we read in Proverbs 22, 6, it says, 
the very famous uh, proverb. Um, one of the best things I think a father, mother can do with their children is to, I want to make sure you get this, <laughs> is to uh, read through the book of Proverbs with them. You could take a child's uh, Bible, you know, this like international child's children's Bible. Uh, you can read it in a you know, easier language, but you read through the book of Proverbs with them to point out certain things. You, you're really teaching them um, deep practical lessons of life. In Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So besides a trade, there are many other uh, life skills that parents can teach a ch child, right? Uh, some of you prayed for my daughter, Becky, who was recently in a bad car accident. And praise the Lord, she's doing much better. But uh, my wife and I taught her to put her seatbelt on every time she goes in the car. <laughs> and praise the Lord, when she had this accident where the car was total, she had her seatbelt on. And so she, she could have died if not for that. It was a terrible accident. There were airbags too. But, <laughs> but you know, a father, mother... We train a child in, in life skills. And so we can uh, assume that uh, Joseph did the same. Uh, Proverbs 6.20 tells us, uh, my son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. So it's not just fathers that teach these things. It's, it's moms too, of course. So for Joseph, uh, child training included teaching a trade and probably many other life skills. but of utmost importance for Joseph and Mary would be the trait would be training their children in their faith, training their children in their faith. Deuteronomy chapter six, verses six and seven emphasizes the continuous instruction in God's word. Their parents are told it's Deuteronomy six and these words, which I command you. So God is telling Moses to tell the Israelites this, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. First, God's word is to be in, in your heart. So um, you can't really teach it to your children unless it's in your heart, right? Not just your head. Verse Deuteronomy 6, 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Teach God's laws, God's word to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And when you're riding in your Tesla, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you're told to conti continually uh, teach your children. It just as just you go through life, just teach them. You're sitting in the house, you're, you're walking, you're telling them. You're always relating the things of God to them. So that's, that's child training. And how do we know Joseph did this? Well, back in, in Luke chapter 2, back to Luke again. You don't have to. Yeah, let's turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Joseph taught by example. Luke 2, 41. And Mary. <clears throat> Luke 241, his parents, that's on page 888 in these Bibles, page 888. Luke 241, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. Now, uh, they went every year at the Feast of Passover. Now, it, it wasn't a short distance from where they lived in Galilee down to Passover. So this is, this is a commitment. And we're going to note later that at least three times a year, the men had to go. Verse 42. And when he was 12 years old, they went, they went up to Jerusalem, according to the custom of the feast. So they, they go to Jerusalem. And you know the story. The Lord Jesus is with them. And he stays behind. And he's in the temple. And we're not going to go into all that. But the point is that... Um, Joseph taught by, by example. 
he went there and he made sure his, his family went with him. We read in Exodus 23, verse 14, I have to turn to it, but Exodus 23, verses 14 through 17, actually, but it says, three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. Okay. It says, none shall appear before me empty. So they had to come at the feast time and they had to bring something. They, they would bring an offering to God. In other words, their harvest, they were going to come and give thanks for their harvest and, and bring a portion of that to the temple. So three times a year, you come. And verse 17, it says, three times in the year, all males sh shall appear before the Lord God. So it was required, especially for the men, three times a year, they had to be at the temple and, and bring an offering. And Joseph made sure he was there and that his family was with him too. We read in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 25, it says, forsake not the gathering yourselves together. So that's, that's our application of this, right? We're told forsake not the gathering yourselves together. And the Lord told us also in, in the gospels and it's repeated in 1 Corinthians 11, this do in remembrance of me. He, told, he said, come together and, and break bread. Remember me in the breaking of bread. So the Jews had to go to Jerusalem three times a year to the temple. We're told to uh, not forsake the assembling together. Church gets together for prayer, for worship. Um, and so <clears throat> Joseph did what he had to do in this regard, brought his family and... Um, Dads, moms, this is this is our responsibility, and I I honor you for for doing that. You know, it's not easy a lot of times. I remember years ago hearing uh, Alan Parks. He was giving a talk. He's Alan Parks. I know uh, Susanna is not here today, but she likes Alan Parks. He's a singer, and he speaks too. But he was saying that uh, <clears throat> his father owned a nursery where they sold plants and flowers and things like this. And uh, he would close on Sundays, he close the nursery on Sundays because it was the Lord's day. He went to church with his family. And so somebody asked Alan, they said, um, I, I bet God made it up to him. I bet he made more money in the other days. And Alan said, no, no, it, it costs him to go. And it costs us something to, uh, to make sure we're with the saints. You know, maybe effort, you know, uh, sleep, miss something else, uh, it costs us something. A year from now is going to be the 100th anniversary of the 1924 Olympics in, in Paris. And it's going to be in Paris again. And uh, I'm sure some of you know what happened 100 years ago in Paris. Eric Little was told he has to run on Sunday. Eric said, no, I'm not running soon. And he lost his medal. Of it. Thankfully, at least in the movie, he was able to run another race that he wasn't favored in, and he won that anyway. But, but it costs us to, to obey the Lord like this. It wasn't easy for Joseph to leave his business and, and go on, take that trip every year, maybe three times a year, but he did it. So he's an example to us, right? And then, um, we read in Luke 2.51, while you're still in Luke. So the Lord is, uh, they find him in the temple. They find Jesus in the temple. He's 12 years old, and he, everybody's listening to him, and they're marveling at his wisdom. But, uh, you know, his mother says, uh, why did you leave us? And he says, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? And then verse 51, Luke 2.51, it says, then he went down with them and came to Nazareth, Jesus came to Nazareth and was subject to them. He was subject to them. We read in Ephesians 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents. Ephesians 6, 2, honor your father and mother. So Joseph and Mary, they saw that they're, children were obedient. Jesus was subject to them. In fact, uh, we read in uh, 1 Timothy 
chapter 3, verse 4, regarding requirements for an elder, it says he's one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For a man, if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? So Joseph was an example in that his children were obedient to him, to the Lord, to, to his parents. <laughs> But there's more in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, for verse 4, it addresses the father. So children, obey your parents. But then verse 4, this is a great verse, okay? Ephesians 6, 4, it says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath or to anger. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Do not provoke them. William MacDonald comments on this. He says, fathers or parents should not provoke their children to anger with unreasonable demands, with undue harshness, with constant nagging. So we're told, uh, don't exasperate your children and thereby make them lose heart. Be reasonable. Don't belittle them. Encourage them a lot, as well as strictly change. Train them. We mentioned earlier, Joseph was... was uh, just and merciful. <laughs> and that's that's how we need to be as fathers. Be just, you got to be just, but you need to be merciful too. Okay. Psalm 103, verse 13 says, As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Verse 14, this is a great verse. Psalm 103, verse 14. He knows that God knows our frame. In other words, he knows, he knows our constitution. He knows what we're what like. He knows our, our weaknesses. He remembers that we are dust. And as, as fathers, uh, we need to remember our children's frame. We need to remember what they're going through. Okay. Maybe the child doesn't obey us because they're tired. You know, maybe it's not the time to give them that big discipline you've been thinking about. Maybe they're distracted by something, something's bothering them. So, <clears throat> As the Lord pities us, we need to pity our children, too. We need to remember their frame. <clears throat> but training does mean uh, correction, not out of anger. Admonition means um, wa warning them. And those warnings, as I mentioned before, can help you study the book of Proverbs with them. <laughs> uh, a spanking doesn't fix the behavior by itself. Years ago, I was... In the Grand Concourse, where I grew up, and I was about five or six years old, and there was a little garden outside our house back then, and I was picking up rocks, and I was throwing them at the cars going, going by, <laughs> and uh, I hit somebody's windshield, and then I was bending down to get some more rocks, and I felt a hand behind my neck, where do you live? <laughs> and so I went inside, and my father entered the door, and and I was turned over to my father. It was Thanksgiving Day, and I remember I had to stand through Thanksgiving dinner that day because I couldn't sit down. <laughs> yeah, so, but I, I got a spanking, but um, I remember a few years later, I was throwing snowballs at cars going by. So it's, it's not enough to just delve out this, this corporal punishment to a child. We have to teach them. We have to keep reminding them, okay, this, this is not wise. I'm just saying this, our job isn't finished when we've just punished a child. We need to keep teaching them. <clears throat> Hopefully your children are not as foolish as I was. <clears throat> um, Proverbs 31, 28. We said Proverbs 31, but that's about mothers. Proverbs 31, 28 says, the end of it, her children rise up and call her blessed. Isn't that great? That have your children's respect. But apply it to the men, too. The most important thing to me, I, I want to be forgiven. But even more important than me, I want to be respected by my children. The respect of my children is, is really, it's, it's on the top of the list here for me, for things in, in this world, to know that they respect me. And it, it, keeps, me, it keeps me from certain temptations, too, because I think I, I can't lose their respect. It's like, we just check out after that. You know? <laughs> um, so what a great thing, right? Her children rise up and call her blessed. Maybe 
we hope they rise up and call him blessed too. Our last thought here, uh, John 6, 42, uh, speaking of Jesus, it says, uh, whose father we know. In other words, they say of Jesus, uh, we know who your father is, speaking of, of Joseph. And Jesus is, is old now. You no, know, he's in his 30s, he's in his ministry, and he, people still know who, who Joseph is. They still know Joseph. So I'm, I'm inferring from that that Joseph had stayed a faithful husband all these years, that people still knew as Jesus is an adult, they still know who his father is. Okay. Ephesians 5.25 says, uh, husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. I think the most important thing that a father can do for his children is to love their mother. To love their mother. It creates security. It creates uh, a picture of them of what, how to behave in this world. We also read it in First Peter uh, chapter three. This is an important verse. First Peter chapter three, verse seven. This is on page uh, one zero five zero in your Bible. One zero five zero. First Peter chapter three, verse seven. It says, likewise, you husbands, dwell with them, with, with your wife, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay. Uh, as a father, like we think of Job, even way back in the Old Testament, he, he would offer sacrifices for his children. He was, he was a priest in his family. As a father, you're a priest in your family. You, you, you pray for them. You bring them before the Lord. And we're told here that your prayers ain't going to go anywhere if you're not treating your wife right. It's a treat your wife right so that your prayers be not hindered. Husbands, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together, the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. We read in Hebrews, uh, let me just go back a couple of pages. <laughs> Hebrews uh, 13, verse 4. That's on page 1044, 1044. Hebrews 13, 4. It says, marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. So faithfulness in, in marriage is, is uh, very high on God's list, right? It says, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Don't be covetousness. Don't be covetous. I, I think it's interesting that that follows the idea of uh, adultery. Don't be covetousness. <clears throat> Nowadays, we don't have to be... Um, we can commit adultery with our eyes just by a click of a, of a, a mouse, right? A click on the computer. But we're told that... Um, we're to honor our wives, we're not to be covetous, and that our prayers will be hindered if, if, we're, if we don't. We don't obey God in this way. Sometimes uh, marriage uh, is up and down. Um, but you know what? We can pray about everything in this world. We can pray for affection. If, if somehow affection is missing in your marriage, we could pray that God will give you affection. F affection means uh, fondness. It's a, it's a tender feeling. It's not, it's not lust. It's desire is, is good in marriage, but this is, this is just a, a fondness. And we can pray that God will, will give us that. 
So lastly, um, Joseph left a legacy of faith. You read in John 7, verse 5, that not all his sons believed in Jesus. These other four sons he mentioned, they, there was a point in Jesus' ministry where his, others, his brothers didn't even believe in him. But we read later they did. We read in Acts 1.14, his brothers are there with the early church gathered together. And of course, uh, James and Jude wrote epistles. We just read from James uh, this morning. So keep praying. Keep praying for your children. I have here a handwritten note. This is from Colleen Citarella. It says, please pray for salvation for four of my children and their families. She mentions her son, Paul and Steve, the daughters, Kathy and Mary, and, and her grandchildren. So God answers prayer. We may have, um, it's a good day, Father's Day, to forgive. If, if, if you need to forgive a father, uh, forgive him. If as a father you need forgiveness, uh, ask for forgiveness. And let's think of the, the great example that uh, Joseph was. Let's pray. <laughs> father, we thank you for um, all that your word teaches us. Pray that we would <clears throat> honor you in our life. And we would leave a good legacy of faith behind us as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.